Hi, everybody. I'm senior editor Patrick McComb from Fine Home Building. Welcome to our webinar, A Builder's Guide to Window Selection, brought to you by Marvin Windows. Um, I think you'd all agree we have a lot to talk about. Windows is a huge topic related to residential construction. <clears throat> and uh, it's one of my topic favorite topics to talk about. <clears throat> Tonight, we are going to have uh, our experts, uh, including Michael Maines, who's a residential designer in Maine, <clears throat> also one of the authors of the Pretty Good House book. As a home designer with a background in carpentry and engineering, FHB contributor, contributing editor Mike Maines pays attention to the practical, hardworking parts of a house, from materials such as mineral wool to spaces such as laundry, closets. For design inspiration, he draws on nature and traditional vernacular architecture. When not designing, Mike likes to work in his wood shop or tend to his homestead in rural Maine. Uh, we also have Josh Salinger, who's a design builder. Josh is CEO and founder of Bird's Mouth Design Build, a residential design build company in Portland, Oregon. In 99, Josh graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a double major in zoology and conservation. I didn't know this. Uh, in 2007, he started Bird's Mouth Design Build with a goal of designing and building beautiful, high-performing homes that transform and improve the built environment. Alex McKenzie uh, is a project manager with Marvin Windows, excuse me, senior architectural project manager. In his role as an architectural project manager for Marvin, Alex works with design and trade professionals throughout the Pacific Northwest and Hawaii to overcome design challenges and bring to life the ambitious aspirations of his clients. When he's not working in the world of fenestration, Alex works on restoring his own 1920s bungalow in Portland, Oregon, where he and his wife just welcomed a new baby and continue to contend with problematic rescue dogs. <laughs> Congrats on the new baby. Yeah. And also, Congratulations. They, yes. Yeah. So far, uh, easier also, than the dogs to deal with. <laughs> for <last>. now. <laughs> yeah, for now. Uh, we also have Greg Novak, who's a retired blazing engineer. And uh, Greg has been a longtime participate, a participant on Green Building Advisors Q&A forum, where he uh, advises posters on issues related to window glass. Uh, in his 27 years working for one of the top window glass manufacturers in the country, Greg was involved with quality control, product reliability, testing, special projects, code compliance, and product development. He spent time as a rep to ASTM E1886 and E1996 window performance test methods that concern window damage from wind blown debris. He was also a member of his company's corporate emerging technologies acquisition team. Wow, this is talk about a team. This is the ultimate window talk team. So I think we should get it started um, by talking about what should we be talking about with regard to the building before we even start talking about window choices? Like what are the things that are uh, important to no, even before you start making window selections. And I'll let any one of you go first who wishes to. Alex, you mentioned uh, a very basic uh, question to have answered before you start. Could you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I start every project with the same simple question of what are the goals? Uh, you know, not necessarily in terms of usage, but oftentimes the owners will have a goal. Is the goal to simply be code compliant and we're going to apply money elsewhere for whatever reasons? Or are we looking to some sort of aspirational performance uh, that's going to exceed code um, support either, but identifying those goals as early as possible? Uh, maybe it's not necessarily performance driven, um, but it could be, you know, we've got a lot of art or, or textiles within the, the home that we want to protect. So now UV damage is um, a concern. And so the goal is to protect those materials. Um, the building I'm showing behind me, that was a HUD financed apartment building. So the goal there was there was very rigorous acoustic uh, performance levels that need to be managed. Not so much thermal performance, but every side of this building had to have a different glass makeup in order to meet HUD's sound transmission levels. Simply knowing those goals from the get-go often influences the decisions from that point forward. I'd even add even before that too, like where are you, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the U.S. has, there's 17, I think, climate zones on planet Earth, and the U.S. has 10 of them. Um, so, you know, there's, it's going to be very different if you're in Florida versus Minnesota versus Oregon or whatever, right? 
So, uh, and also just the, the insulation that goes across uh, the United States. So there are parts of the United States like Arizona that have a lot of sun and there are parts like Seattle that have less, right? So uh, those things, uh, you know, kind of first and foremost kind of play into like what type of window you might decide to choose. And I, to your point, Josh, I would say not only where the building's located in the world, but where it's located on the land, its orientation, um, the scale of it, you know, a, a smaller, we were talking about this earlier, a smaller building, even if you want high performance envelope, isn't going to require the same glazing as a larger building. Yep, totally. And even where that building is oriented on its site, right? Uh, are your views to the north? Um, that's going to make it that, you know, from a comfort or performance standpoint, you probably want a better glazing if you have big views to the north and that's where all your losses are. You know, if you're on the, uh, in, a, in a forest versus being just an open prairie land, you would have very different, uh, choices or, or reasons why you would choose a different window. Well, like Mike, I was, we were starting to talk about your background and, and, you know, you've got that sash window to your, uh, I think it's your right shoulder. But then that corner, those two, you know, you've got beautiful views of the forest beyond and you went with a, a smaller profile, uh, probably some sort of direct glaze type product because you, I'm guessing you wanted to capture as much of that view as possible. Or, or exactly, or exactly, Alex. Yeah, this is actually a project for, for, for a client of mine, but it's just one of the most um, energy efficient houses in Maine. It's just a simple little ranch style house, but we went with European style, US made uh, triple glaze, UPVC windows. Um, and they wanted, or and my clients wanted some, some big views. This is actually facing Southeast. So we actually didn't want too much sun, but mm. we did want big views. And so we looked carefully at all the various coatings and options on the windows. And, and, and we should also talk about uh, materials like not only window operation but the materials like we ended up or with pvc i often try to uh, uh, not use plastics and petroleum products for environmental reasons but when it comes to windows pvc windows are usually the least expensive there are pros and cons to them um, but yeah no this this was a good good project with uh big picture windows and then some limited operable windows i think i think that's that's another thing people who are used to um uh, the way American houses have been built for the last 100 years, you expect every window to be operable. Mm -hmm. But now that we have a lot of air conditioning and mini splits and things like that, if you if you uh, uh, really think about it, in most cases, you really don't need too many operable windows. You need some operable windows for safety and to get some airflow, but you don't need every window to be operable, even, even on a small house. It's, it's just not necessary. Strategic ventilation. Strategic well, ventilation. Yeah. That leads to a good point because the reason, you know, operable windows can be leakier, right? They can have, uh, they're more expensive, right? So you can get by cheaper with less operable windows. But this is a point I wanted to make is just this uh, concept of thermal bypass, which is, you know, paying attention to the, you know, the leakiness of your window. And in North America, the window manufacturers are not required to report how leaky uh, their windows are. They do have to meet a certain air tightness standard. It's 0.3 CFM uh, of leakage per square foot uh, at 75 pascals, but they're not required to report that. But we know that there are certain types of windows that perform better than others. We know that like Mike, the ones behind you, those fixed windows are gonna be really airtight. And we can sit here and get really uh, wonky about what our U values are and our spacers and how thermally broken they are and all this great performance stuff. But the air tightness accounts for 90% of the performance of the window, because what good is a U-value of 0 0.10 if you're just letting the cold air in or the hot air out or whatever it is, right? So uh, air tightness is a really important thing. And one way to do that is to choose, you know, your operations of your windows um, smartly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'd be remiss if I didn't jump in, Josh, and say, uh, well, you're absolutely right. There is no requirement for that disclosure. Uh, some brands, namely Marvin, voluntarily disclose certifications and allow third parties to provide that data so that, you know, don't take our word for it. Trust WDMA, AMA, NFRC, the, 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 the independent third parties that test our products. And then those, those test reports are publicly available. Um, Alex, what, makes them available. What, Alex, what on a, on a window label would describe the 
the air leakage of the product? Where would you look for that? What, what measurements? Yeah, would you- uh, it's a great question at the risk of getting too far into the weeds. Um, oftentimes- uh, we're going, man. Okay, let's go to the weeds. Um, <laughs> you know, you know what Josh is really talking about is it's, it's distilled down into like design pressures. How much pressure does the window resist? Well, a DP rating typically only means how much wind pressure, so structural wind pressure it can resist. Design pressures can also refer to air infiltration ratings, which is what he was talking about, and also air infil- or, uh, water infiltration. Most window brands are not going to um, disclose their air and water infiltration ratings. So they'll just say, we're a DP30. That's 30 pounds per square foot of structural wind load resistance. Well, Marvin is, is not alone in this, but among the few brands that take all three of those, air, water, and structure, and disclose it as what's called a performance grade, PG rating. So if you see a PG 30, that not only means that it's a 30 pounds per square foot of uh, wind pressure resistance, but there's also then a corollary air and water infiltration rating that aligns with that PG rating. Um, The typical window sticker is only gonna give you just that generic PG rating. So you'd have to go do your homework, but whomever you're buying that window from, if it's got a PG rating, that means it's a certified rating, third party. And that means there's a there's an associated test report that you do have access to. Um, you typically just would have to get that through uh, the, the window supplier you purchased it from. Um, they are available online, but it's 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 a needle in a haystack hunt. Um, we've got them at our fingertips. Getting back to our goals conversation, this seems like one of those things that you would definitely want to know before you spec the window is what kind of wind speed and water infiltration yeah. you could expect, right? Yep. Uh, if you're on the beach, you want a more water resistant window than if you live, uh, you know, in the Midwest, right? Absolutely. Of course, you have tornadoes and other considerations. Is there a minimum, Alex, that you think or any of you think uh, people should expect uh, before even selecting a window? Is like, is there a minimum DP or PG rating that you shouldn't go below? Uh, to get going into the DP rating. Um... A lot of people will ask, what is the wind speed that equates to the specific DP? For example, if you have a DP of 50, your DP is 50, what's the wind speed with that? And a quick, simple formula for that is just take the square root of the DP and multiply it by 20, and that gives you your wind speed within a couple of miles an hour. So a DP 30, uh, Greg, in your example, would be? Well, I'm going to go with a DP 50 because that's easy. I can do this. Easier math. Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. So basically, that's 140 mile an hour wind, roughly 140 mile an hour wind. Now, also keep in mind that these windows are tested when they're tested for the DP. They're tested at one and a half times the actual rating. So if the rating is 30, they're actually tested at 45, and if the rating is 50, they're actually tested at 75. So again, you can you can extrapolate from there to find out what the actual wind velocity would be the uh, the equivalent wind velocity uh, to the to the design pressure in P- uh, PSF. Or correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I used to think DP rating meant the, or the wind speed associated is when it would leak water. But what I understand now after some bad experiences is that you could have a lower DP rating that could actually leak water. The DP rating is more about air infiltration and structural integrity and those kinds of things. You could get leakage with a DP 50 window at uh, 50 mile an hour winds. You can because the DP is actually, uh, the water infiltration is actually 15% of the DP. So if your DP is, do the math in my head again, it, basically if the if the DP is 50, then you're taking 15% of that and that's what the water is tested at. So it's significantly less than the actual pressure loading. And wind velocity is actually separate entirely, um, or excuse me, air infiltration is separate, that's a separate test entirely. So while it's related to DP, it's not based on the DP. So a wind test is something entirely different or is, is it separate, but it's, it's, it, it goes into the grade, uh, ultimately it goes into the grade, but it's a separate test. So DP is, is the pressure, pressure related and also water related, but again, it's 15% of the DP is what the, it's tested at for water infiltration. I think it's worth bringing up here just the types of windows too, right? Like, yeah. so if we're talking about air infiltration or water infiltration, you're gonna get different uh, results from a double hung window than you would with a tilt turn window or something like that, right? So, um, you know, Mike, you, oh, great, perfect timing. Um, oh, good. <laughs> you know, the worst performing windows are the double hung and sliders, because if you think about those, they just have like, what is it, like a, a felt uh, thing that has that slides across the glass, or maybe it's a brush or something like that. 
And that's just simply not very airtight or thermally broken, right? Or for water or air transmittance either, right? Whereas if you get something that closes in upon itself, like a uh, tilt turn or a hopper on encasement, those actually have gaskets that you can squish up against and get a much better seal from. So one of the first things you want to think about is the style of window and the window types. Um, and some of them just uh, due to their geometry or their function work better than others. I've always heard that casements and awnings were good because as the wind blew, it actually compressed the sash against the, the weather stripping. Is that bona fide yes. information absolutely. or is that lore? No, that's as a general rule of thumb, I think that's absolutely true. And I, I think that's precisely what Josh is talking about. I would go further to say whether it was an outswing or an inswing casement, um, you get sort of that same benefit, kind of like inswing and outswing doors. Uh, when you're at the coast, you tend to do outswing doors. Like in South Florida, I think you're only allowed to do outswing doors because as that wind pressure builds, you're, you're compressing uh, against the weather strip more. Same principle for windows. The European style tilt turn is predominantly an inswing tilt turn type thing. Um, but like Josh said, and, and Mike's showing here, those have such a, a, a robust series of multiple gaskets and interlocks that they tend to seal up real well. Um, I, I do want to just offer that there are what we call second generation, although they're more like 15th generation double hungs. Um, you know, the double hung is one of the oldest windows operating window styles in the world. Christopher Wren invented it like, you know, 400 years ago. Modern day uh, within the Marvin world, what we call the Gen 2 or G2 double hung, um, it actually carries a hurricane rating, but we're talking about a top of the price point, um, very high tech type double hung. Works great if you want a traditional looking home that performs more like a modern home or, or needs to meet some sort of windborne debris region like the Gulf Coast or out in Hawaii. But generally speaking, what Josh and Mike were, were showing and talking about there, absolutely true. Swinging sash, whether in-swing or out-swing, are going to provide better air and water seals than sliding sash, whether they slide vertically like a single or double hung or horizontally like a glider. Greg, his research uh, tended to demonstrate that uh, some window types are better than others, too. In the sense of what you're saying, like water tightness or air tightness, yeah. that's absolutely, yeah, what Dave was saying is absolutely true. If the window moves, if it slides, it's not going to be as tight as one that seals up that swings. It's not, it's not even well, close. And Greg, you had brought up a great point earlier about um, the, the available glazing pocket. You know, how big an insulated mm -hmm. unit, dual or tri-pane, can you put in a window? <clears throat> and if you've got two slat, sash that have to slide past each other vertically or horizontally, you're, you're inevitably going to be limited on how thick a thing you can have in there. Whereas if it's just one monolithic sash that swings out or swings in, you can pack a much bigger uh, IG unit, insulated glass unit in those. And, and you you Absolutely. have more on that because you can do a lot more with more air and more glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. You know, they make uh, some Definitely. really nice, there's a number of manufacturers um, that make some really nice uh, tilt turn windows that uh, mimic double hung look mm -hmm. uh, that can meet a lot of the, you know, the historic neighborhood rules and things like that. Um, so there, there are options out there that give you that look, but still have, uh, you know, a, a casement or tilt turn style operation to them. Does anyone want to offer a guess why double hung windows have become the standard in the U.S. Uh, despite their performance hit and the availability of other window styles for decades, maybe a century? Simplicity. Uh, double hung windows are real easy to do. And in the past, you know, that's tradition, tradition and simplicity. A double hung window is just simply easy to make. It's easy to maintain. And it works, generally speaking, to keep the weather out. It doesn't work to the standards that maybe we're looking at today, but it's still, I mean, it's still, you know, you put a double hung in for, you go to New England or you go to the upper Midwest and everything is double hungs and and they they performed. They performed like you expected them to over the years. But now we're looking at a different standard and we're looking at something that says, you know, we have to be better than what these windows can generally perform at. I, I, you know, I had the opportunity to work with some windows and like double hungs that had like interlocks and things that, you know, would help them. They still can't reach the standards of say a built turn or, or a really good casement. Yeah, I think in addition to tradition, there, there, there was a functional benefit to them in the pre-HVAC days. You, you do have, and this is what's silly about the West Coast. By the time the, the, the building was happening here, say a hundred years ago, somehow we'd lost the lesson of the double hung because Midwest and, and Northeast, like Greg said, that, that's the ubiquitous window type. And you get cross ventilation within the same window opening. Hot air goes out the top sash, cooler air is coming in the bottom sash. By the time you got to the West Coast, everyone just started putting fixed top sash and calling them single hungs and that defeated the purpose. 
uh, you need that cross ventilation. But in the modern era, with climate control, HVACs, uh, heat pumps, and mini splits, you don't need that built in cross ventilation. I like it. My 1920s bungalow is full of double hungs, and I'm replacing them with modern double hungs, the, the, the ultimate double hung G2 by Marvin, because uh, it seals up nice, but it still gives me that cross ventilation. We've actually got a nice day in Portland today, and I've got my windows open. <laughs> I'm going to guess that most folks who have double hung windows don't even know the top sash goes down in many yeah, right. cases, right? It, and they most of them got painted shut over the last hundred years. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or, or the other side is they have had it for a long time and the top sash, they can't keep it up. They have to put a stick to that, that too. Yeah. yeah. That was like the windows in my house growing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. One or, of the great things that's happened with here. windows, Greg, is glazing. Uh, the, I, we were talking ahead of the show how cool the technology is between spectrally select, selective coatings. Do you want to talk about that? And I think it relates to we were earlier conversations about orientation of the house. Some folks are actually now choosing glazing uh, uh, elevation specific. Oh boy. Um, I think Mike was actually say, make, saying something, that, if I can interrupt real quick on the previous, he was about to say something that I'm not sure if he caught it, but I'm gonna have to think on that one just for a few seconds. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Mike, if you wanna go ahead, I'll think for a second here. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I was, I was, I was just going to say I'm actually just replacing one of my windows now. My house was built in 1830, um, in Maine, and and even in Maine, we do have single hung windows, which a lot of people don't realize. You think of double hung as being ubiquitous, mm. um, um, and the window has been repaired and has storm windows and has lasted almost 200 years, but it's finally time to replace it, and uh, we're actually going. After a lot of thought and discussion, we're actually going with a new triple glazed double hung. Um, although it's not the highest performing, the whole house is not super high performing. We'll add a high performance addition that will have, you know, European style windows. Um, but it's it's really the swinging aspect. And I discussed this with all or with all of my design clients that when a window swings, it basically takes up space. If it swings out, it takes up exterior space. If it swings in, it takes up floor space, uh, tilt turns. People uh, 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 don't realize that the, the usually you operate it as as just a little bit opening you don't very often swing it in but if you do swing it in it takes up a lot of floor area i'm usually trying to do very small houses and so it's um or there's a lot of geometrical considerations i'd say when it comes to determining which window style is is, is appropriate folks would say i'm not worrying about the right things mike but do you worry about like what modern glass is going to look like with your other old windows in your house i mean they they are very different in appearance yeah no it's um uh, or the window we chose is reasonably historically correct, and we do have uh, coatings and such that it'll be reflective, but right now it has 50-year-old uh, mill finish aluminum storm windows, so it won't look uh, worse than those. <laughs> and um, one thing on a, on a design, I think a lot, of, um, a lot of modern houses, a lot of modern designs are very flat and planar on the facades. People don't uh, know why they don't build houses like they used to, but a lot of it is shadow lines, and so when you have uh, modern windows that are nicely inset, like the ones behind Josh that he designed, those have a built-in shadow line, although they're modern windows, but a lot of modern windows are very flat and planar, whereas traditional double hungs have two shadow lines and they're inset, and just uh, the shadow adds character to the house that we can still get today. You just have to understand that what you're actually looking for is a shadow line um, when it comes to design, and actually windows also are uh, usually appreciate a little bit of overhang to help uh, uh, keep water away and, and provide a little bit of sun shading. We have some great uh, comments in the chat, so I'm just going to catch up here a little bit. Um, Jeremy says, I believe in Florida, front doors are outswing uh, mandatory, which I find yeah. interesting. I'm guessing that's for weather tightness. Absolutely. Um, Jenna uh, asked, how does egress factor into window selection and energy efficiency? That is an oversight on our part, so not mention egress, right? Um, absolutely 5.7 square feet am i am i right in my calculation alex yeah yep and minimum width the uh, clear opening of 20 inches minimum clear opening height of 24 and it's not one of the three it's all three and if you do your quick math a 20 by 24 clear opening does not equal 5.7 so it's um you know all of the above and and to the comments we were talking about earlier about window styles of operation those are absolutely going to influence or rather egress influences your window style. Even if you're wanting to do a traditional looking home with double hung windows, chances are 
you may need to do like a faux double hung, a casement with a, with a simulated check rail in the bedrooms to meet egress. You can make get a bigger egress opening, out of a sliding right? set. Right, exactly. It just becomes yeah. such an enormous window because the clear opening is at most only half of the window frame. Um, but, you know, we, we you can build a double hung or a horizontal glider big enough to meet egress. It's just it ends up being effectively double the size it needs to be to in order to meet that code. Um, as far as I mean, was the second part of that question, energy efficiency. I'll throw this to the to the design build guys. I, I'm not aware of an egress window necessarily performing worse than a non egress window. But I think, Josh, you were the one that said operable versus non operable. Yeah, the non operable window is always going to perform better. And I would argue that a smaller window that still satisfies egress requirements would be have better performance than a larger window that meets. Well, egress. that's actually not necessarily true because if you think about uh, ad absurdum, if you have a really small window, you've got a lot of frame and you've got a lot of spacer, right? And if it operates, you've got a lot of hardware, right? And those are all potential thermal bridges. Oh, yeah. The most efficient part of our window is going to be the gas inside the glazing, and so usually center window is going to be the best, and you're going to get the most losses around that. So the percentage of frame glazer and those thermal bridges on a small window compared to glass versus a very large window uh, and the percentage of glass to frame and all that makes that the larger window is actually more efficient uh, from an energy and comfort perspective. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, from egress, you know, I mean, it, it, it gets on a design. Maybe I'd kick it over to Mike, right? I mean, it's, um, if you've got a window and you've got two uh, facades in the corner or something like that um, from an energy or comfort perspective and cost perspective, maybe you don't want to make both of them, uh, you know, egress, maybe just one of them and pick the other one to be fixed, or maybe you could mull them together or something like that, depending on the space. Yeah, they used to put a the vocab word there, oh. M-U-L-L. -L. I, I don't know if everyone knows. Mulling is a fancy word for connecting a window Joining. to a window. <laughs> Following up what Josh is saying is exactly right, and it's a little bit counterintuitive because the larger the window is, the more efficient it is. But yep. the larger the window is in the wall, the less efficient the wall is overall, because the yep. wall inherently is more efficient than the window is. So while you get a more efficient window, you get a less efficient wall as yep. you grow well, bigger. This is a good point, though. This is a great thing about windows is they can be gains or they can be losses, right? So back to design, you may want to have a large, you know, less wall and more window if you're in a cold climate and you have the, the desire to bring in more heat, right? So you want to think about yes. using windows strategically because, you know, this is a very basic thing about windows is like you can really uh, play with them in the sense that you can tune your house or really affect the comfort uh, by saying, hey, I want to have a bigger glass here because I'm in a northern climate uh, and I can bring, even though it's a less of an R value than the wall, I might want more window than wall because I can bring in extra heat. Or conversely, uh, you know, if you're in a cooling climate, uh, you may want to have less window and more wall. So it's it's and calculus. And going back to what we were saying about orientation, you never want to have a high large windows, high heat gain windows on the west wall. I don't care. Oh, yeah. I don't care if you're anywhere. I don't care if you're in New England or Minnesota, anywhere. You don't want to put that on a west wall. But if you want to put it on a south wall and you have appropriate overhangs, which Josh, I mean, that's, that, I'm definitely in your area. It, it, they can be great. I mean, the wintertime you gain heat in the summertime, they're protected because you have the, the overhangs keeping them in shade. And it's, you know, using high solar gain in the south does make sense. Using high solar gain in the west doesn't make sense. To the north probably doesn't really make sense. To the east, maybe, depending where you are. But Maybe you're, we're you're actually not. touching on two, two points at once there. Uh, I want to finish up this uh, this orientation question because it's such a good one. Um, you know, what Patrick was asking earlier, it's I've seen this in just the last, say, 10, 15 years that your average home in America, they just pick the same glass package for all four elevations. That was easy. That's what we did. And anymore, it's that, like you just said, east and west facades are getting different coatings north and south are getting different coatings it, it's to you know tune the building or or just strategically buffer the kinds of light you want to in, come into the home um and that dovetails neatly into the the most recent question i just see here from i'm, I'm watching the questions too patrick uh john snell was asking about shgc solar heat gain coefficient that's precisely what you're talking about um, whether or not you want to invite that solar heat into the home, or do you want to block it? Well, as you said, on the west side, doesn't matter where you live in America, you're going to typically want to block west sun from coming into your home. But on the other sides, it it really depends on where the home's located, how it's oriented, and and uh, and you know, like Josh 
talked about, like, what kind of home are you building? Is it passively heated? In which case you want to invite in solar heat. But if you're in Arizona, uh, you probably don't want that solar heat gain. So playing with the solar heat gain coefficient number based on all those criteria is absolutely going to impact the, the choice of glass and ultimately the choice of window. Alex, can I ask you to interpret the number for folks? Like what should the number be if you don't want to have uh, a lot of heat gain on your Western elevation, for example? Uh, it, it's like golf, the lower the number, the better. So if you don't want solar heat, so basically the higher the solar heat gain number, the more solar gain is coming into the house. And what is the scale? Uh, gosh, I don't know. Is it one to a hundred? Between zero, zero and one. To one. Zero to one. Oh, that's right. It's a decimal. Sorry. Decimal. Point. So uh, point three. Okay. Back when Obama was in, what was that? The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It was the 30-30-30. If you had a 0 0.30, U factor, a 0 0.30 SHGC, you'd get 30% uh, tax rebate. Really simple numbers to play with, but it was an oversimplification because a 0 0.30 uh, in Washington might be an okay solar heat gain number, but that might overheat your house in Arizona. And I think an important thing to think about with solar heat gain coefficient is, you know, the, the you know, the less solar you let in, the darker the window gets, right? So yes, that pivots yes. right into visual transmittance. And I've heard that homes with um, those uh, those coatings on low solar heat gain windows uh, can be look muddy and and make it uh, uncomfortable in, in in the house. Have you guys heard similar complaints? I've heard yes. that before, but I don't think it's. I don't think it's consistent among people. I think the vast majority of people are perfectly comfortable with it. And the larger the window, obviously, it makes a difference. Um, when you're talking about the different coatings, obviously, you have, well, uh, a little bit about soft coat. Well, I'm, in fact, I'm, go, so, I'm sorry, back to solar heat gain coefficient. Something to keep in mind is the fact that the solar heat gain coefficient is not just the glass, it's the frame as well. Right. So the, the rating of the solar heat gain coefficient is the whole is the opening in the in the in the wall. It's the entire opening in the wall and not just the glass. So you could have two windows that are exactly the same size that have exactly the same glass package that could have two different solar heat gain coefficients because one has a wider frame than the other one does. And that's is it because the way. frame is a thermal bridge or is it because it's leaking air from the hot outside or is it it's both? Okay. Okay. Neither one is blocking the sun. It's blocking the sun. So it's also VT is the same way. Your visible transmittance is the same way. So that it's the whole, the big old opening, the, the rough opening in the home is what it's based on. That way, again, it goes back to what I was saying is if you have two windows that are exactly the same size that have exactly the same coating, they could have a different visual transmittance and they can have a different solar heat gain coefficient simply because the frame is taking up more room. Or if you put uh, grids, for example, in there, that'll lower your solar heat gain coefficient because it's blocking the sun because sun isn't going through the frame, it's not going through that. The plus side of that is, um, gives you a comparison between two different windows you can look at them but you know for example you might have a solar heat gain coefficient on a particular window that say like um on the glass alone is like 60 percent but when you put that glass into a window it might be 40 percent and people will look at that and say wait a minute i'm looking online and this is saying that the glass is 60 percent, but my window is only 40 percent. so if you say that your house has a 40 percent solar heat gain coefficient that doesn't necessarily mean that the glass is going to be dark what it means is the fact that it goes to the size of the window and it goes, you know, comparison is going back to the U factor, the fact that the larger window is more efficient than a smaller window is, it's the same thing. So if you have a small window and you have a larger frame on it, your solar heat gain coefficient is going to be very, very low, even though you might actually have glass that allows quite a bit of heat through it. Hmm. Or how deep you set it in the walls, like these here. Or yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. the wall, right? So that the, the wall will actually cast a shadow and will affect yeah. your solar heat gain coefficient. And you know exactly. that matters yes. when you get into wonky things like uh, passive house and things like that. Um, you know, Can we talk a little bit about uh, impact rated windows. Uh, my understanding is that windows are key to the survivability of structures in wind events, because if you have a breach through a you know an opening, um, the house can pressurize and very devastating things can happen, catastrophic uh, failures. Uh, what are the typical ways to make windows tougher to survive impacts from flying debris? And I'll ask all you if you know. Uh, actually, this is my area of expertise. Um, this is what I did. Uh, when you mentioned about the ASTM committees, that these two committees, that's exactly what they're about in this one. 
So, so are you developing the test, Greg? Is that for missile testing? Is that what I'm gathering? The original test came from the University of New Mexico. It came out of New Mexico. Or I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Texas Tech, my, my mistake. Texas Tech developed the original impact test. But there's multiple, there's two different tests primarily. There's the Miami-Dade County, and there's also the ASTM E-1996 and E-1886. And there, there, there's some similarities or some differences. But essentially, what happened is, is you want to build windows that have an interlayer in the glass. They're laminated glass windows. And like a, a windshield. Thickness, yep. Like a windshield, but thicker. So, and there's, there's multiple interlayers. I mean, this is so in-depth. Um, there's multiple interlayers that you can use that have different performance values. But typically speaking, if you're using a PVB, you're going to be about a 90 thousandths or 2.28 millimeter um, thickness on the interlayer. The glass thickness really isn't that important. You can go anywhere from two millimeter up to six millimeter if you want to, or thicker if you want to. Uh, and there's a second product called Sentry Glass, which is a, an, an, no, an ionomer. And it's five times six, five times stiffer, excuse me, it's five times more tear resistant and 100 times stiffer than the PVB, which is the windshield of a car. And uh, again, the, the test is you throw a two by four at it at um, 50 feet per second. And then you put it on a cycle wall where you simulate winds by using um, pounds per square foot and up to um, 9,000 cycles back and forth, basically wind gusts, 9,000 wind gusts on the thing. And that's where, as I mentioned earlier on the DP, uh, the DP is dependent on that. So the DP, again, going back to the, what I said earlier, like the DP of 50, for example, would be 140 mile an hour wind in the testing, roughly. And a DP of 100 would be a 200 mile an hour wind. So um, it's... Why? Well, yeah, yeah. It's it's so in depth. I don't I don't know how to cut it to make it shorter and more simple. No. Uh, but, so, do you think yeah. it's a good test? Do you think it's an accurate accurate representation? It's of very accurate. Happens? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can base that out too because we've been doing the impact windows. Um, company's been doing impact windows, uh, going back to after Hurricane Andrew. And the fact is that mm -hmm. if you look statistically, um, there basically have been no failures of wind of houses that have collapsed because of failures of impact windows. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's so they've been I mean, completely yeah. successful is what I just heard. If yeah. I've they've been very successful, I can't say completely because I don't have 100 percent of the data. Plus, I've been out retired for a little while now, but they have been very, very successful. Um, but I think the were, important really point to, to what Greg's talking about is uh, the reason they're successful is, is we're not just the, the window industry isn't simply taking laminated glass and putting it in a window and calling it an impact window. The important part of what he was describing there are those tests and those tests then yield certification. So mm -hmm. what we say is an impact rated window is in no way, shape or form the same as its non-impact rated cousin. It's a completely separate product that carries a completely separate certification based on those ASTM or Miami-Dade tests. Um, and in addition, different I mean, about Miami Glass is the lion's share of that, but you also then bet it in a different structural sealant there are additional mechanical fasteners. The installation method has to be different. It's a more structural connection with more fasteners to the, the opening of the home. Um, and then typically you're seeing the window sizes decrease somewhat in order to meet those certification tests. And, and by the time you get into Southern Florida, like Miami-Dade, you are no longer mulling windows to each other. Mullions don't exist in Miami-Dade for the reasons of impact. So it, it, it's a large, as Greg touched on it, it's a large conversation unto itself. Um, but, but really, we just say it's it's a certification. Uh, the shorthand that gets used often is impact zone three and impact zone four. Impact zone four, IZ4, that's Southern Florida. Impact zone three or IZ3 is the rest of the Gulf Coast starting to work its way up the eastern seaboard. And now uh, a couple of the islands out in Hawaii have um, these impact zone three requirements for what are called windborne debris regions. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's 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 a really discussion all on its own. I mean, I was trying to shortcut it, but yeah, Alex made some really good points there. Um, my first association with Marvin, as a matter of fact, had to do with testing their products um, before they had their own test labs. We had a test lab, and they would send their products to us, and then I would test them. And that's how I got associated. In fact, the the DP the DP formula that I said about you know dividing or taking the square root and multiply by twenty actually it came from the fact that when I was testing Marvin windows, one of the Marvin people said, how, what's the wind speed on this? If we're doing like 50 DP 50 or DP 60, and I had no idea. So I actually sat down and, and mm -hmm. developed that small formula based on some other data that I had and came up with it and it works. So I've used it for, for years. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did it for Marvin, so you know that, Alex. I did it for Marvin. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, you mentioned that you've got U PVC windows behind you, but I think it would uh, behoove this conversation to talk about different types of uh, frame materials that we. we yeah, really there, there was a question earlier about aluminum, fiberglass, and all of, all the others. All all valid materials. Yeah, I'll I'll pull up a couple of pages from our pretty good house book where we uh, just sort of went over the basic ones. I think we might have missed one or two, but uh, we have have the most common ones here. So yeah, this is a North American style window competitor of Marvin. Let me like on frame a little bit for uh, Alex's sake. Um, Thank you. Appreciate that, Mike. <laughs> Um, it's it's a uh, wood frame window with an applied coating. It's either uh, aluminum or or a fiberglass type coating on the exterior. You know, relatively narrow frames, just what we're all used to here. Um, European windows also can come with a wood frame or with PVC. Um, Let's um, touch a little bit on that, Mike. Uh, we haven't talked at all about that frame versus frameless, uh, flangeless windows. Uh, I'm getting that all screwed up. Yeah. Flangeless versus flanged windows. I'm sure most folks uh, build in this country are familiar with flanged windows uh, that are affixed to the sheathing and into the framing, whereas a European window, not really sure how that works, honestly. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, uh, uh, usually, uh, usually if you're doing a European window and you're going through all all the extra effort and and often uh, they actually cost a little more, not always, but you usually want to get the ideal thermal performance. So you inset the windows into the wall. The best thermal performance is when um, is when the window, which is basically thermal, it's it's the equivalent of insulation. It's 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 insulation you can see through. Um, so you want that roughly in the middle of your thermal layer in the wall, the middle of your insulation on high performance houses and passive houses that starts to become important. Um, on conventional houses, most people are used to using flanges and installing th them flush with the sheathing. You can really do it either way. There's just, just different installation techniques. Um, and they install usually with a masonry clip style thing. So you basically snap or screw in a metal strap and then you s attach that metal Onto strap. Onto the side of the window frame, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sometimes you'll um, actually screw directly through the frame, but that's, that's less common. Um, uh, yeah, so e e either installation technique can work. The thing that frightens me and probably other folks who first learn about, uh, you know, flangeless windows is the uh, you're relying on uh, tape, right? Flashing tape to make it weather tight or am, am I not, just oversimplifying that? Not necessarily, that? no. Uh, interestingly, if you set the window into the wall to get that better thermal performance like Mike was talking about, it also protects the wall, uh, the window from wind and water because you're setting it in uh, the wall a little bit more versus the flanged windows, which tend to sit to the outside of the wall. So they tend to get more exposure. So you're kind of reducing some of the exposure first off, which is a positive thing. Um, but you know they can be sealed with uh, numerous different things. You could seal them with tapes, certainly. Um, the, in, there's also the water seal and the air seal, so two different things that you want to pay attention to, and they can be the same thing or different things. Um, tapes is one, sealants are another one, so backer rod and sealant, and there's some really nice high quality uh, sealants that can be used. Um, and another one is like an expanding foam gasket um, is something that you can attach to the window around it, and it starts out maybe a quarter inch or so, and then it can expand however big you need it to, they make them to expand to three quarters of an inch, one inch, inch and a half, uh, that can kind of fill that in and complete your thermal, your air, and your water control layers uh, from the wall to the window. And so there's numerous different ways to attach the flange list windows, but in North America, it's just, it's less common. So having installed lots of flange list windows, you get to a point where it just becomes window installation all over again. The first few you do will probably be a little trickier um, but once you have done some, uh, you know, at some point we learned how to install flange windows, right? I mean, at some point we all learned everything we're doing. Um, but once you learn how to do a flangeless one, it's, uh, gosh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd say it's easier, but I don't think it's any harder. Uh, so one of our participants asked, uh, don't you need a sloping sill with a flangeless window? And, and do you? Use, I'm sorry? Uh, she asked if you need a sloping sill. Oh, so... Yeah, I mean, so the Europeans, oftentimes you see details where they don't have a sloped rough sill. Um, I am a believer that, you know, windows are not 
perfect and water is going to get into windows at some point. And we want to make sure we're protecting the rough opening and ideally sloping that out with uh, a way for that water to get to the outside. Um, so we tend to slope our rough sills. Um, and then the sill on the window itself is also gonna need a water shedding layer. So, you know, with the, the flangeless windows, oftentimes they key into the bottom of the window, um, but there's various different ways to approach that. And I would recommend reaching out to your window manufacturer and they oftentimes are really smart people uh, like Alex here who can give you Alex, some. What, <laughs> what, do you, what do you tell folks to do, Alex? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, still? absolutely. Everything Josh said, uh, commend him, two thumbs up, no notes. I, I'd say we go further. A every rough sill should be sloped because, you know, we learned the lessons of the 90s. You don't stop water, you manage water. So if you're if you're installing a window thinking you're going to keep water out of that rough opening, you've already lost. You need to have a pathway for it to get out and water follows gravity. So if you don't have a slope on that rough sill, water will eventually get in. It's going to sit on that rough sill. It'll never get out. Um, I just pulled it up. It's the ASTM E2112. This, this is not a Marvin instruction. This is a industry standard ASTM E2112 calls for a piece of sloped cedar siding to be placed atop that rough sill and then you begin your flashing buildup, your, your peel and stick or your flex wrap or whatever, because that sloped piece of beveled siding has the right slope to get water to travel out and away from the, the interior rough opening. That, that's an industry standard, but I, I hate to say it, the majority of job sites I go to, I don't see them doing this. And it's, you know, they're missing a chance to build in insurance against water sitting where it shouldn't. Yeah. And, I, uh, that's a huge or most or, or most building science um, experts say the same that windows will always leak eventually um having done hundreds and hundreds of renovations i don't i don't agree i don't think every window leaks i'd say one out of 20 to 50 windows leaks something like that and so it's what's the matter do you want to take a few extra steps to basically ensure that if you're the unlucky one and one of your windows leaks is it going to be a problem or not and right. Um, I, I don't. Um, I don't think one in twenty is is very good odds. So, Mike, I'll um, I'll go further. You know, we we sort of jokingly, but not so jokingly, talk about how there's only two types of windows in the world: those that currently leak and those that will leak. Um, yeah. And and all you know, I'm going to loop in the whole thing because we're all part of the same team. It's not necessarily the the manufactured or handmade window that leaks, although it could be. It could be a pinhole in that baccarat and sealant joint. It could be a piece of tape that delaminated after the window was installed. This isn't a finger pointing exercise. It's just a recognition that at some point, water gets where we don't want it to. And, and again, that was the lesson we learned in the 90s where we were trying to build waterproof buildings. No, we built mold factories. Water eventually got in. So now we do water management. We understand that water will inevitably get in places you don't want it to be. So you provide a pathway for it out and you help it get out. Water follows gravity. So give it a slope, give it positive wash, allow it the opportunity to escape once it gets in where it shouldn't be. Yeah, I'd say you want to make sure you water seal from the exterior, the head and the sides and leave the bottom open. But then on the inside, you want to air seal all four sides, right? So that way we're not letting air leakage in so we don't get that thermal bypass that I talked about earlier that just destroys your really expensive low U value window. Um, but we're allowing, we're admitting that water will get in and allow it to escape. Well, and Josh, you bring up a good point about the air seal. Uh, you know, talking about like QA and QC, one of the things I have really enjoyed is the growth of on-site testing. Uh, here in the Northwest, we have an excellent AMA certified testing agency called QED. I, I love having them get on a job site and test a window opening. You know, they'll tape it off, they pressurize it, they blast it with a bunch of water. They're doing that AMA 502 cyclical test rate. And, Sorry, and I've Alex, uh, AMA, what's AMA? Uh, American Architectural Manufacturers Association. So again, like Greg was talking about, these are, these are sort of independent third-party trade groups that set standards. And that way we all can be measured. You know, it's the scientific method. You got to have a baseline that everyone's measuring to so we can tell what's good, what's bad. The AMA 502 is, at least as far as I'm concerned, sort of the gold standard of field air and water infiltration testing. Um, there was a fantastic project we did here locally where water was getting in during that 502 test. And this was not a finger point. The, the installer, myself, and the uh, flashing membrane representative put our heads together. And what we found is that 
the team that had applied the interior air seal had simply troweled it slightly thinner than, than critical mass required. And so under pressure, it was rupturing and allowing the air to get in. Great, I'm glad we caught it on this one window before they did the other 200. So they were able to go back, reapply it, maintaining the minimum critical mass, retested it, everything passed, and that way the team knew what they needed to do going forward. Uh, fantastic case of where everybody was trying to do it the right way. Nobody was cutting corners intentionally, uh, but we were able to catch it before it became a big problem down the road. Uh, back to the chat. Um, this is something I never thought about. Uh, what about windows for uh, wildfire areas, uh, wild urban interface uh, zones? A wooey. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What? Do, a wooey. Can you get windows that are fire resistant? Yeah. Typically, they require tempered glass in those cases. Yep. Uh, tempered glass in the window, and the tempered glass will hold long enough to allow you to escape. Um, it can candle the heat. It won't fracture as much as just plain and the old glass will. So that's it's a very much a requirement. Um, you probably wouldn't want to use vinyl in those areas. I don't know what the code actually is in those cases, but a lot I of don't believe we we allow us for vinyl, but I could be wrong on that. Actually, yeah, the I don't UPVC, think so the the unplasticized, which is the stuff that you get in Europe, doesn't have the BPA and the phthalates, which are the plasticizers that make it more uh, flexible. Okay. Um, those actually are fire resistant. The UPVC, okay. like what's behind yeah. Mike. Uh, but the typical U.S. North American vinyl is terrible for fire. So and I, a lot of that has to do with, um, so in addition, like Greg said, it's tempered glass, not necessarily in both panes in a dual pane unit, because uh, this was developed out of California. The, the, what was originally called California fire glass is now just called wooey. It's one of the two panes. And, and I don't know if they dictate interior or exterior. Greg, do you know if they're? I believe it's the exterior. Exterior pain, okay, yeah, and it is. Yeah. It, it's really just yeah. to prevent for the the spontaneous combustion or spontaneous breakage that occurs under under uh, fire. And then it's and to be clear, these are not fire rated windows. They're not meant to like resist the transfer of fire. It's just to prevent immediate combustion of the interior materials or to send glass all over the place. So like, yeah, I guess the the average vinyl window has a melt rate at about 173 degrees, which on a warm day in Portland will deflect. But I guess the UPVC does well. Obviously, all wood windows, those are out, but a clad wood window uh, with the right type of exterior cladding, uh, an extruded aluminum rather than roll form, that'll get approved. And also fiberglass, fiberglass windows, because their heat deflection temperature is north of 350, those will be allowed in a, in a wildland urban interface. And going back to the tempered windows, there is actually... Um... What they call some people call a super tempered window, which uh, won't get won't get in technical how you do it, but it's a, it's it's a more tempered tempered glass, um, mm -hmm. so it would last longer in those applications than standard tempered wood. I don't know that it's required, but I know that some people do use it. Can we talk about some other applications where you might want tempered glass, uh, gentlemen? Well, basic safety applications um, anywhere there, someone can get hurt, but there are specific requirements um, that are required the code requirements. And I'm gonna have to do this by memory. Um, help me out, guys. Uh, it's 18 inches from the floor, more than nine square feet, more than 36 inches high, and within 20 inches of a door or a stairway or, well, anything in the bathroom that's close enough within reach of a bathtub. I forget the exact numbers. So those are actually required. Um, that was pretty dazzling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, and unless you've got a very generous bathroom size, I, you know, typically any window in a bathroom, because I think it's within yeah. five feet of the tub or shower surround. So, yeah. I mean, my little bathroom, I don't, the whole thing is five foot across. So, any window in that space mm -hmm. is going to get tempered. Yep. Did your yeah, uh, window have to be tempered, people? Mike? Oh, or the ones behind me? No, we actually yeah. set uh, the sills just above 18 inches to avoid tempering because of the additional cost. But a lot of manufacturers, once you get above um, like five by five or six by six in size, they'll automatically temper it for shipping. Yep. So Absolutely. it's just not always up to me to reduce the cost, but I'm always, always, always trying to save folks money. Um, but yeah, and and of, of those hazardous locations, I think the one that you know most builders know that um, any window within 18 inches of the floor needs to be tempered, but it's actually, it has to be all of those. If the window is smaller than nine square feet, which is, or like a two foot by three foot window is less than nine square feet. And it's actually to the edge of the exposed glazing. It's not to the, like the rough sill or the uh, finished st 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 
the little cap is is to the edge of the glazing. So just there are little tricks you can do to try to save some money. Um, but if you want to be safe, temper it. And not only save money, but you know, like that view behind you, Mike, um, Greg, you can talk about the, uh, you, you can get distortion with a tempered glass unit that you don't have with typical annealed glass, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You want to work real hard. The other thing too is uh, we always talk about tempered. We talk about safety glass, but laminated glass meets every code that tempered glass does, right? except fire resistance. That's the only one. And otherwise laminated glass will do the same thing. It's more expensive, um, but it's a lot more versatile than tempered glass is. And one thing that happens, um, as Mike, you talked the other day about the, about the railing situation. And when you go to tempered glass in a railing or in a situation like that, you break out tempered glass, you got a big hole opening. I mean, the glass is gone. It's going to fall down. You have a big opening. You put laminate in those applications, it's not going to fall down. So it's like shower door. Shower doors are tempered. And if a shower door breaks, you've got a million pieces of little tiny glass all over the place. But if you have laminated glass in those applications, it breaks. It just has a crack in it, like the windshield of a car. You have a crack in it, but it's not going anywhere. But it still meets all the same safety applications. Greg, how much of an upcharge is it for laminated versus tempered glass, roughly? Do you know? I'm not a pricing guy at all. I, I suspect Alex would have a better handle on that. But think about the fact that the laminated is two pieces of glass plus an inner layer that's more expensive than the glass is. Plus, it goes through more processing than tempered does. So it's going to be significantly more. I don't know how much. Maybe Alex has an idea. I don't. Mm. About a three three x increase yeah. at least. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's significantly more expensive. Um, and, and like Greg said, it's it's really three pieces sandwiched together. So the weight, the added weight, is is pretty significant. Um, you'll see limitations uh, based on window operational style, simply because like a swinging sash holding that additional weight uh, could really damage the hardware. So th there'll be size limits. And not only is the product more expensive, but I, I know some local builders who will charge a premium to install laminated windows because they're so much heavier. I've heard that about hurricane rated products, especially they are very heavy. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, same reason. It's, it's laminated glass. You can't get a hurricane rated window without laminated glass, but laminated glass is not the only thing that makes it hurricane rated. There's also reinforcements and different screws. I mean, just everything about it is it's just a more robust window, yeah. like it's substantially more robust. I think we'd be remiss in our uh, duties here. Uh, what can folks get wrong either choosing or installing windows that can make uh, your customer's life or your life miserable? <laughs> Uh, going first to the window package as a VE. And I'm not saying that just because I'm biased as the window guy. Windows we obviously on air money, value engineering, right? Right, value engineering. I mean, I, I, I've been doing this a long time. I know that there are very few ways to save money in a construction project. You can't get cheaper gypsum board. You can't get a cheaper framing package. Windows, there's an enormous spectrum of costs. So there are ways to save money. I get that. But you're talking about one of the more critical elements in the building envelope. And if you cheap out on the envelope, you're going to have a bad time, maybe not today or tomorrow, but eventually you are degradating the lifespan and performance of the overall building to save a few bucks. Uh, nothing irks me more than seeing a window package go from a high quality window, whether it's my brand or somebody else's, to a really low quality brand and then when you look look up the job later, you still see the the marble counters, the Gagano stove. The they cheaped out on the the really most important part to have fancy finishes on the inside of the home. I think that is a total miss, and they're going to be paying for it down the road, whether they realize it or not. Well said. I'm gonna... I say the same thing. Like we often, I consult on a lot of projects with architects and builders and clients, and I always say like spend as much as you can, you know, on the windows, you know, like don't cheap out there. Like obviously everyone has their budget, um, but buy the best windows you can afford um, as a, as a general rule. Um, hundred percent agree. Don't, don't cheap. They're, these are the holes in our walls and they're skylights too. We didn't even talk about those. Those are holes in our ceilings, which are even more difficult. Right. Um, so like, these are not things to cheap out on. Um, and it goes back to those goals, right? It goes back to like comfort and efficiency uh, resilience, durability, aesthetics, all these things um, can be impacted by that initial cost. Uh, and so it's uh, short term thinking and uh, it's kind of just a, a fool's errand to go cheap on those really cheap vinyl windows that, you know, 
you can get and I box. guess it's a mistake to cheap out on the installers too, right? This is not oh, yeah. a time yes. for the low bid yes. job because no. the the installation is everything with Windows. Am I right? Yes. A bad window is made better with a good installation, and a good window is made bad by a bad installation. Mm -hmm. Going back to the window companies themselves, I, I hate the term value engineering because, again, having been involved with the impact products, and they're very expensive to build for the window companies. So the, the materials that they use, and I can't count the number of times that window companies have passed the initial testing and then later said that they were failing the testing. They would ask me or ask us, why are they failing the testing? The first question we had is, what did you change? And I said, well, we value engineered. And it's like, that's why you're failing because you've just simply, you've taken a good product and turned it into a not good product. Yeah. Now, Mike, what do point, people do wrong with regard to the design aspects with Windows that drives you crazy? I don't know if we've got enough time to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, well, but I, what I was about to say kind of addresses that, Patrick, is, um, you know, the, the word value engineering, I think, gets a gets a bad rap sometimes because it, it, it often just leads to lowest common denominator, cheapo stuff. Um, if you're working with a good team, a, a good window supplier, a good window brand, a good architect, engineer, envelope consultant, value engineering could be a wonderful collaborative experience where you aren't degrading the performance and durability of the building, but you do have to make some compromises. So a, a simple one is this. I've dealt with folks who are um, very much in the lumber industry. Oregon is the epicenter of that to this day sometimes. Um, People want Douglas fir. It's our state tree. Well, there's about a 30% price difference between vertical grade Douglas fir and mixed grain Douglas fir. Huge savings, same tree. Obviously, they look different. But if you can manage those expectations, show them some lumber samples, they still got to have that wood window. It's still got to be dug fir. But you can save 30% by going from a low yield, hand selected VG fir spec to a whatever comes off the truck mixed grain first spec, great. We haven't changed the performance or durability of the building in any way. And that's just one example of a good way to VE a project rather than just go, can't afford wood windows, guess we're using plastic. Yeah, I, I often hear, or the one um, I think uh, that annoys me the most is people automatically say right off the bat before we've talked about anything else, I can't afford triple glaze windows. We haven't talked about sizes, quantities, brands, materials, anything. It's just, I can't afford triple glaze. It's like, well, you can get some pretty inexpensive UPVC triple glaze windows, or you can get some ridiculously expensive custom made. In fact, in fact, within 20 minutes of me in one direction and 30 minutes in the other is probably the least expensive high performance vinyl window and probably the most expensive uh, medium performance wood frame window. Uh, and, and, if you compare single glaze or double glaze from the fancy place to triple glaze high performance from the vinyl place, it's it's orders it's like an order of magnitude difference in cost. So just sure. it's really more about the actual numbers. And the way we build them too, our manufacturing, because you go to Europe, you can go to a bow, which is the you know the version of a Home Depot there, and get a triple pane thermally broken tilt turn window right off the shelf uh, for like two hundred and fifty bucks. Like you know, I mean, it's it's ridiculously cheap. Because they've been able to just, you know, get the manufacturing. It goes back to what I was saying before. Like once you learn how to do something, there's a learning curve. But once you, you know, retool and do it that way, it's not necessarily more expensive inherently. It's just different. Yeah. Well, I mean, Let's try and get to it. on that. Greg, you, I'm yes. sure you can speak to the the work, the, the cost of tri paint is is already coming down in the U.S. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, I think the, the the difference in the European style as as um. Josh was just saying, compared to like the American is, Alex, you guys, how many different styles of window does Marvin make across the board? Versus, dozens. Yeah, exactly. And versus a European where they're making basically one style, fixed or not fixed. And it's almost like saying, it's, it's like comparing the Volkswagen Beetle, which was reliable and it was efficient and it was actually a really good little vehicle to an American car company that had like 12 different varieties of cars that they made and all of them totally different. And every year they had to make a new one. It's, it's, and again, I'm not comparing, I'm not saying that the triple pane tilt turn is a, is, a, is a cheap Volkswagen, it's a, it's a good window. But exactly as, as Josh was saying is the fact that they know how to do it. They make one product and they make it really, really, really well. And that drives your cost down, which is, yeah. you know, 
versus in the American market, that's not possible because you can't sell one process, one style of window in this market because people won't accept it. I mean, I have triple pane windows, or I mean, I have triple pane tilt turns. I've had them for 17 years and I'll use them again. I would never not use them, but not everybody likes them. And as, and again, it's it's ubiquitous in Europe and not so much here. And, and, and going back to triple pane, I'm sorry, and to me, anyone who lives in zone six or seven or above should have triple pane windows. I don't think that's even an option. And they are becoming much more common. Obviously, um, there are now automated systems to build them. And that, you know, they didn't have them in the past, so they were more expensive because you had to automate. But again, a, a, going back to the manufacturers themselves, manufacturers may want a triple pane window, but they won't necessarily re-engineer their window their windows themselves their sashes to accept an adequate sized triple pane they want to fit the triple pane into their existing glazing pocket yeah. as we talked about the other day and so you're getting a less efficient even though it's a triple pane it's a less efficient triple pane or you put krypton in instead of argon which makes it more efficient but also much more expensive doing it that way and you know as long as the more you can do something consistently, the more you can do something without reinventing the wheel every time you make something new, obviously the price goes down. We have only scratched the surface in this conversation. I, I was okay. just like, your mention, Greg, was like, we haven't talked about gas fills at all. And I'm sure there's other stuff that we haven't got to, but I'd like for y'all to share some final thoughts about Windows. Uh, before we go. And I wanted to let folks know that this webinar will be available on the Fine Home Building uh, website. And uh, before we go, I will scroll back and find that. Here we go. Finehomebuilding.com slash webinar. So look forward if you want to catch it again or refer a friend to check it out. And we'd love to hear what you think um, or have future suggestions for webinar topics. That would be a huge help. Uh, whoever goes first is great. One thing that I'm looking at um, that you see in the European market is uh, called low iron glass. And this glass is much more clear. Uh, and it's also just the nature of it. It's more energy efficient and more thermally or acoustically uh, broken. And so it's 16% more energy efficient just on its own because they remove some of the iron for, from it. And so when you see a window yeah, that's blue in the US, it's because of the iron in it, right? And so you take that out and the window gets really clear. So not only are you getting these better performance metrics, uh, but you walk into a building and you're like, wow, did you just clean? You know, because it just feels cleaner because the light, the visual transmittance is so high. And so this is like one of those win-win things that, uh, you know, Cardinal Glass builds, the, you know, the European Cardinal Glass and the North American, the same company owned by the same people, but they're doing uh, low iron glass in Europe, but not here in North America. And I'd love to see that come to the States, make a huge impact. Josh, I think you're talking about Guardian because Cardinal doesn't have an impact. It doesn't have Guardian. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yep. 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 Yes. No problem. One reason that low iron glass isn't as common in the U.S. is because some of the materials that are used to make the low iron glass are not available in North America, so they have to ship the materials in. And so, mm -hmm. typically, American companies not not entirely because they do make uh, Vitro, for example, makes um, 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 ah can't think right now. Vitro makes uh, Star Starfire glass, which everybody talks about. Starfire glass. Yep. But the problem is that low iron glass in North America typically is going into shower doors or going into uh, uh, other aesthetic considerations rather than going into windows. Um, but yeah, Cardinal, you mentioned Cardinal. Cardinal makes 25 million IGUs a year, and that's about a third of the total market in the country. But Cardinal does have a low iron capability in one of their plants. But again, primarily this stuff is going into applications other than windows because there is no real call for uh, low iron glass in the US in the window market, there just simply isn't there. Um, actually, Josh, I'd love to sit down with you and go over the, the, the specs on the low iron versus the not low iron. I, I think it'd be a really great discussion, but obviously not not here right now because yeah, I'm, I'm we'll tie this up for the next hour. <laughs> we'll have to have more of these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously I have opinions on low iron. I've worked with low iron for years and years and I know quite a bit about it and uh, a fair bit about it. And so, yeah, so it'd be fun, but again, not now, but. Um, I'm sorry, I interrupted. I kind of changed the subject there a little bit, but yeah. So well, I'll uh, deal off of what Josh said. I, <laughs> I uh, you know, from my vantage point at the manufacturer level, 
Uh, much like Josh is excited about what he's seen happening elsewhere in the world, I'm just excited about what I'm seeing happening throughout the industry, globally and even domestically. Um, the last 20 years plus ha have really been a revolution in glass and window technology. Um, and that was without codes pushing it. I, I think that was just the market demanding it, which is great, right? That's what the American model is built on is market demand. But now we do have code action. And I think it's our neighbors to the north in Canada that we're looking across the pond to the Europe saying we want to be more like them. And uh, at the risk of oversimplifying it, Vancouver, BC, or overall British Columbia introduced their step code a few years ago, a major leap forward. Washington took notice. Their state code changed to look a little bit more like the, uh, British Columbia. Now Oregon has followed suit. Um, guess what? Now California is feeling like the uh, the left out kid, and they used to be the leader. So um, buckle up, because California is going to introduce some tighter codes here. And as is typically the case, once California makes a decision, the rest of the country follows. Um, industries notice this. Uh, I, I know that Cardinal's working on additional technology to help keep pace with this. Uh, Marvin is too. Tripane is going to become more of the common thing. It's just a very exciting time. I, I think we're going to be building vastly more efficient and more durable homes in the years to come than we have for the past hundred years. You're here. Or my last thoughts I'd say are um, even uh, today's very best windows that perform at around our, our eight, our 10, our 12 in that territory are still pretty lousy compared to a wall yet somewhere between 10 and 30% of our walls are usually windows. So, uh, Code 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 changes are great, but do energy modeling and find the window specs that work best for you and your situation will probably be uh, somewhere below uh, code minimum values. Um, and yeah, yeah, the uh, the best window is still a lousy wall, so do the best you can. <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> This was a great conversation, y'all. Thank you so much for being here. And thanks uh, all of you for uh, watching this and participating with your great questions. It really makes for a richer experience for all of us. So thank you for that. Uh, I really want to thank uh, our sponsor, Marvin, for organizing this event and uh, helping to support it. And I really want to thank our panelists, Michael Maines, Josh Salinger, Alex McKenzie, and Greg Novak. You all were fantastic. I love talking to you. And I hope you all will come back for our next webinar on window, windows or whatever subject it might be. Thanks for being Definitely here. We're open for part two. Thanks for having yeah. us. Look forward to Definitely go part two, yes. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you, thank us. you guys. Pleasure, thank you very much.